visitors last last time and we're just really thankful that it's starting slowly but surely to take off and to be there for people who are in need. There are many meetings if you want to just take a look somewhere along the line at your list that's in the bulletin and um, birthdays mm -hmm. today we've got three birthdays we just talked about Nora's birthday Nora's birthday out way out there in Washington happy birthday to Nora happy birthday to Jackson Heinet and Allison Bindert and happy birthday on Monday to Eric Webster how is he related Al it's your son happy birthday and Dawn Holdley's birthday is on Wednesday and Saturday we've got two at least in the bulletin we have Beth Resch and Leah Savino so happy birthday to all of those and we um, give thanks for a birthday right we look back at the thanks for the blessings in the past and with anticipation for God's goodness moving forward. So those are the announcements for this morning. We will proceed with the service with the chimes. How special this morning. That's good. We're just going to wait and appreciate your being here. Thanks, Aubrey. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Mackenzie. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much. How good it is to see those young people running around this morning. <laughs> Let us pray together. Loving, compassionate, forgiving God. We are humbled that you are with us this morning, that you were here before we even gathered together and that you wait for our songs, for our prayers, and you wait to speak with us through your word. Lord, may this time together be recognized as holy. So we offer all that we are in this time. Receive it and may it bring you delight. We pray this in your name. Amen. And there's a prayer of yours. <clears throat> you go. <laughs>
Good morning. The call to worship is Psalm 100, found on page 481 in your Pew Bible. <clears throat> Shall we read this together? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. <clears throat> Let us join together and sing hymn 476, O Worship the King, verses 1, 4, and 5. Receive God's blessing, God who loves us so much and offers us grace and mercy and peace. Be unto all of us from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we receive God's blessing, we do so and say, Amen. Please be seated.
That's a song of hope, isn't it? <laughs> As you were singing, I was thinking of the Ukrainian people. God can deliver, God can do the impossible, right? So thank you, choir. An interesting and unexpected song this morning, but thank you. <laughs> um, Judy, you give me a hand and move this painting over, please. If you take that side. Thanks, there we go, all right. This is good right here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Can I invite the children and those who may be young at heart come to the front at this time? I was expecting Gregory and Freddie, and here we have Mackenzie and Aubrey. How lucky we are. Have a seat. Good to see you again. You know what Aubrey did? She came and visited me in my study this morning just to say hi. That was very special. So I'm gonna ask you a question. What have you got sparkly shoes? You're sparkly today, look at you. So yeah, fancy is a good thing, isn't it? So here's a question. What if you got invited to visit the queen? Wow. <laughs> Can I tell you that when I lived in Scotland, if you were married for 65 years, you got a letter from the queen. Can I tell you that got in a frame and got hung up in the house, right? So if you were invited to visit the queen, would you wear sparkly? How would you get dressed up? Yeah. You dress in things you like, right? And that make you feel good and that are special, right? All right, and now here's a, the here's a thing. If you go visit the queen, before you can go in and see her, there's a person that tells you what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. You know that you can't sit down unless the queen sits down first. There's the rules, right? And what are, one of the things that you know that you would have to do if you went in front of the queen? Curtsy, that's right. You would kneel. Uh, why? Anybody know why would you kneel going before the queen? You know, Aubrey, yeah. Because you appreciate royalty. Because, yeah, what do you think, uh, Mackenzie? That's right, and you can't sit down if the queen doesn't sit down, that's right. Or the king, if it was a king or a prince or a princess, right? Right. So you have to do that. You, that's expected of you. It's, it is. So, so when, when we kneel, it's a sign of appreciation and that the queen is really special, more special than me. So I'm saying, right, I honor you. So in the Bible, people kneel, right? God asks us to kneel because we show reverence to God. We recognize that God is better than us. And it may, you know what else it does? It puts us lower than, which is a reminder that we are lower than, right? We're not as, we're not as special or we're not as powerful, right? And it's a recognition of that. It's a recognition of humility. Now I read this morning, the ladies Bible study is reading a book and every week there's a different focus. And this week the focus is shoes. Shoes, I know, right? And the first story I read it this morning was about Noah, uh, Moses. And you know what Moses did when he, when he came to the fiery bush? God said, take your shoes off. Why do you think God said, take your shoes off? Anybody? Because it was holy ground. There was this burning bush and it wasn't burning up. God was there. And God says, um, I'm God. So it's a way of bowing down. It's a show, an outward sign of humility of what we believe in our hearts. We're showing that with our bodies. Now, come here and look at this picture. Yeah. This is the story of the prodigal son. And look at him. What is he doing? 
he's kneeling, he is. And he is really showing his father how sorry he is in humility and in reverence for his dad. Because his dad, even though he did something really terrible, his dad is saying, I love you. That's pretty wonderful, right? So by that young boy, that son kneeling, it's a reminder that we kneel and we show that we are thankful, that we don't deserve it. So kneeling is a pretty important thing. Okay, we can come back and sit here. I think that the church personally, I think the church has lost something because we don't have pillows to kneel with anymore. We don't have uh, rails at the bottom of the benches to kneel because that physical action is a really helpful reminder. Like when we fold our hands to pray, right? We close our eyes, we bow our heads. That's the same kind of thing. I think we've lost something in that physical show of humility, which is really part of what Lent is all about. So you ever kneel when you pray, guys? Yeah? Awesome. How about we do that now? You want to kneel with me? And let's all pray together. I know you guys aren't going to kneel, okay? <laughs> and repeat after me. Let's all pray together. Holy God. We thank you that you love us. And we know that you are great and we are small. Help us to always remember that and be thankful that you love us always. Amen. Thank you. Thank you guys. I'm glad you knew when you pray sometimes, that's really, really good. You have to do that again, even when we're old. Thank you so much. You may have noticed that there's a different order of worship this morning. We are now going to do our, I forgot our song. Let's sing the song a minute. We sang it before. It's a nice song for Lent and I'm, we're gonna sing it like we did the other day. I'll sing a line and you repeat after me and then we'll sing it together. When I pray, Soft and, low. Soft and low, when I pray, this I know, God will always hear, and then it goes down, God will always hear. It's a really nice song for Lent. Let's sing it all together as much as you can remember. When I pray soft and low, when I pray this I know, God will always hear, God will always hear. God will always hear, it's a really good reminder for us. So we're going to do our offering at this part of the worship service and a reminder that we have a special offering today for the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance and you can put your envelopes, I was told, in the offering plates. So may we give generously.
Your God of grace and God of glory. We've been focusing on the prodigal son this week and we've been reminded of your grace. You forgive and you give. And all that we have comes from your grace. As we offer these gifts now, O oh Lord, we pray that you will use them to help those in need, to help those people in Ukraine, to further your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you. We're we have a brief, a little bit more brief. Uh, uh, Bible passage this morning, because we're just going to focus in on verses 25 to 32, because we're focusing on the elder son today. And the first week I read from the Common English Bible, and last week I read from the message. And this morning I'm going to read from the um, NRSV, which is in your pews, the pew Bibles. And we're going to be reading verses 25 through 32. Here now the word of the Lord. Now, remember, we have the earlier part of the story, right? The younger son tells dad, hey, I want all the stuff that, that uh, is due me. And dad gave him half of the inheritance and he ran away, right? He went away and he comes back. I'm moving ahead of myself, aren't I? Thank you. Let's do the uh, uh, prayers first. <laughs> See, I tell you, I make mistakes all the time. Okay. Um, joys and concerns. Can you raise your hand and share one? Dennis in the back of the room. And Nora's agreed to carry the microphone around. Thank you, Nora. Norma. A <laughs> uh, prayer for uh, Pat Rao. Uh, she was tested Friday and she has COVID. Prayers for Pat Rao and for all the people that were in Bible study with her on Thursday night, right? Yeah, and I hope it's a very mild case and all will be well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Thank you, Dennis. Other prayer requests. Those of you on Zoom? Well, I've got a list of them while you're uh, working on it. Yeah? Okay, can you hear me, Reverend Eileen? Is this Denise? It's Denise, yes. Yes, Denise, we can hear you. <clears throat> um, can we please have prayers for Marilyn? Um, and Randy Spielberg. Marilyn's been in the hospital this week with congestive heart failure. Um, Randy says she's doing better. She's hoping that um, they're hoping that she'll come home in a couple of days. Um, and um, he wanted me to, you know, ask for prayers this morning in church. Um, I talked to Randy this morning and she's, you know, feeling pretty good. She doesn't like taking a lot of the pills, but she's hanging in there and hopefully, um, He'll call me in a couple of days and let me know that she's home and okay. see what she needs. So if we could all pray for the Spielbergs. Thank you, Denise, for Marilyn and Randy um, and for um, rapid healing, right? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Thank you for that, Denise. Others? Reverend Eileen, this is Diane. Can you hear me? Hi, Hi Diane. How's yes, that? um, we got a big joy. Uh, my daughter uh, went to uh, the doc, several doctors and uh, some tests, and her bleeding in her brain has been absorbed, and they cannot find any aneurysms whatsoever. It's oh. such a big relief. Oh my gosh, Diane, I had you on my list. I'm glad you're here. Um, and I'm glad to hear that great news about Sally. That is uh, certainly a reason for rejoicing. Thank you for sharing that. Lord, in your mercy, continue to hear our prayers. Thank you, Diane. Reverend Eileen. Well, thank you for all the prayers. They really are appreciated. Absolutely. You bet. I heard a voice. Yes. This is Dave, Reverend Eileen. Oh, Dave, are you on Zoom? Yes, I am. Oh, hi, Dave. How you doing? I'd just like to thank the OPC family for all the thoughts, and prayers, and I'm very thankful of and appreciative of what's been sent to me, and I'm 
truly grateful for that situation. I thank you very, very much. We're so glad to hear your voice and you and Dottie, you've been in our prayers. You were on my list too. I'm glad you're here with us and we continue to pray for you as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we're really happy that, um, that Sherry and uh, J Jamie are here this morning with us. Good to see you guys. I know it's, it's, it's hard on the whole family, isn't it? It isn't just on mom and dad. So, yeah. Thank you, Dave. It's good to hear you. Lord, in your mercy, we'll say it again. Hear our prayers. Others. Ann Metz. I noticed that she was moved to therapy and um, I didn't get it. I visited her last Sunday in the hospital and she was a little discouraged. She wasn't sure if she was going to be able to go to therapy, but she has. So we're really thankful for that. And we pray for continued, hi, continued blessings and healing for Anne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Reverend um, Eileen. Yeah. Can you hear me? It's Rita Cahill. Can you hear me? Hi, Rita. Yes, we can. Okay. I want to ask for prayers um, that came in not too long ago to me for Marsha. Um, she's back home, but she has congestive heart failure, kidney failure, and cellulitis happening. And um, so she's in bad, bad situation at the moment. I also want to offer prayers for the refugees and the homeless that are here amongst us and for all the all the people that I pray for within my own heart, body and heart that God will minister to each one of them and help them in all their different situations and also for prayers for me Rita that um the docs will get I have health issues going on at the moment and the docs cannot find um, the cause all the way. So I keep going down and down with everything, my energy, my everything, um, my breathing and all of that. So I'm asking prayers for all of, all of my requests, dear Reverend. Rita, thank you for being with us and for sharing that. So prayers for Marsha. Prayers for all of those people that you pray for, for the immigrants and the refugees and the homeless, and for you, Rita. Um, it's, it's such a wonderful thing to know that even before we say these names, God knows them already, and God is, God is working and um, healing and being present. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Thank you for that, Rita. Thank you. I have on my list... We continue to pray for the Cassidy's, Lord, in your mercy, and all of those who are loss of someone that they love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I also have um, on my list um, the closed closet opening again this Saturday. We pray that there will be more folks that can come and use it and that it can be a blessing to those people who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And thanks for all of those who come out um, to fill bags for the people's pantry on Thursday. It was good to be together and to do that simple work that makes a difference in people's lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And of course, we pray for the people of Ukraine, people of Afghanistan, and the many places in the world where there's so much suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And looking at you, Sim, prayers for all of our veterans, for those who are serving right now, I know that they have, um, some of these guys and women are helping teachers because there's a shortage for teachers and others are being sent to places like Poland and close to what's happening in, in Ukraine. So we pray for all of those serving and those who have served too. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Thank you. Let's continue our prayer together. You got on this morning, when we got snow again and we're ready for spring. We thank you for your faithfulness in the, in the seasons, when the sun comes up in the morning and the moon comes out at night. We thank you that you are present when we struggle. You are present when we 
rejoice. We are thankful, O oh God, that you know, having walked this earth, what all of the emotions and all of the things that we face are all about, and that you never leave us alone. That's your promise. Lord, we've prayed for a lot of people this morning, and we know that you are already there walking beside them, for which we also give great thanks. Lord, we pray for this church. We pray for all the meetings that are coming this week. We pray for the shut-ins. We pray for Harriet Ireland's family. Harriet passed away this past week. And so we look to a service on Friday. We pray for John and the family that you will bless them as they now will miss their mom. We thank you for your faithfulness over the years of 90 years of her life and for your faithfulness for all of us, oh God. May we be mindful of your presence and remember that you are as close as our breath. Hear this prayer, we pray, oh God. And now as we pray the prayer that you have taught us, may we pray that from sincere hearts, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Norma. Okay. Now, <laughs> we're going to turn the, to the scripture reading. Let's take a moment of silence. We've been thinking about a lot of people in the last few moments. Take a moment of silence to center our hearts. Let us pray. Dear God, we are hearing words that we know from your word. Sometimes it's easy. I know I remember I was in that place too. Uh, I know all this. I don't even need to read it anymore. But help us, Lord, to have eyes that are eager to read and see, hearts that are open, so that we may hear what it is that you have to say to us today from these texts. We pray this in humility. Amen. Okay, as I was saying before, I'm reading from the NRSV, which is the Pew Bible. And we're just going to be read this limited, limited part of Luke 15. And we were just remembering the younger son ran away, comes back. And the older son, he never left, right? Now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. The slave replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then the elder son became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you. I have never disobeyed your command, but you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the cat, fatted, fatted calf for him. Then his father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. Let us be guided by these words. Thanks be to God. I don't know, but some of us have never had a religious experience, like that great aha moment when we were saved. Some people have that. I never did. Maybe you're like me. I grew up in a Christian home, went to church every Sunday, twice a Sunday, and never even thought about 
It was, it's just been a part of my life the whole time. Could this be the way it could have been for the elder brother in the parable? Maybe he never thought about being a son, what it meant or, or who that really made him to be. Maybe he just lived his life, worked hard, got up early, worked till late, never really asked for anything special. Maybe he just was. And then one day his younger brother does the unthinkable. He demands what is his and he leaves home. And he leaves his older brother carrying all the responsibilities of the land and the property and the livestock, the servants, answering to the father from morning to night. The younger son left all that behind, took off for a good time. And while he was away, the younger brother didn't have to see the sadness in his father's eyes. He didn't have to walk in at the end of the day to find the father sitting by the door waiting, hoping that perhaps this time, this night, the younger son would show up again at the door. And we can understand that for this elder son, resentment began to fester. The more he thought about it, the more he was convinced that he was the good son and that that other son of the father, he was the bad one. In the way we think, in the way we live, that makes sense, doesn't it? I've always been able to relate to this brother, this older son. I was never discontent at the point where I rebelled or questioned, except when I was seven or eight, ran as far as the front porch. I did my best. I believed that what I was told was true, and somehow deep inside, it seemed to make sense to me. I did all the right stuff. I had a hard time with people who questioned, who walked away, who didn't take their commitments seriously. And secretly, I believe I was the good one. And they, they were all the bad ones. Has that ever happened to you? The problem with this way of thinking is that it becomes all about me or all about us. And after a while, we can't see past ourselves. I believe that's how it was for that elder son. He started to think about the ways things were turning out. And all he could see was that he got the bad end of the deal, the dirty end of the stick. And for all his good works, he had been dealt a bad hand. And the more he thought about it, the more it ate him up, the more resentful he became, the more righteous he became, and the more rotten the younger son became. It's an interesting story, isn't it? This older son had everything he could ever want. His father was a wealthy man. He had everything that was his father's. The servants were still cooking all the meals and, and doing all the jobs they had done before. He still had a fine place to live and wonderful, elegant clothes to wear. He still had a community. He still had friends. His life hadn't deteriorated in any way from when the younger son left. He was still home. But was he? And then this younger son returns. What a bummer. Yes, he looks terribly malnourished, poor and miserable, but he deserves that, doesn't he? He left. He squandered everything. He was the bad son. And what about this, this embrace, this demonstrative show of affection, this reestablishment of his place in the family? When he of his own free will rejected all of it months before. This runaway son is not getting what he deserved. Neither is the faithful stay-at-home elder son. And the last straw came when he returned from the field, this older son doing all the stuff required of him, all that working like a slave day in and day out. He returns to the house to the sounds of a party. And he has to ask someone else what's going on. That deep sense of rejection, cutting him beyond words, takes him over. And all this emotion, all this resentment floods out of him in his conversation with the father. And we can understand that. It makes sense to us. If you can see the painting, otherwise take a look at your bulletin cover. When we look at the painting, we can see some real evidence that he is home but away. Look as he stands in the picture. He is without any doubt 
the main observer of the younger son's homecoming. Now, and remember, we've been talking about him. He wrote a book on this painting. He says that this picture makes him realize the complexity of the reunion. It could not have been easy. In Rembrandt's expression of the parable, we see the elder son as a spectator watching, but not taking part. He appears withdrawn. He looks on, but there is no joy in his eyes. He doesn't reach out expresses no welcome, he stands there in a passive aggressive stance. Rembrandt places this returning sun not at the center of the, pa the painting but off to the left, but still that's where the light shines. That's where the embrace is vivid. The other side of the painting stands the elder sun and there's this space between them. Now one says that the space creates a tension, asking for resolution. The older son keeps his distance, unwilling to participate in the father's welcome. The father's hands are spread out and touching the son, the returning son, in a gesture of blessing. The elder sons are clasped together and held close to his chest. The father's red cloak is wide and welcoming. The sun's red cloak hangs flat against his body. There is light on both faces, but the light from the father flows and engulfs the younger son. The light of the elder son is cold and constricted. His figure remains in the dark and his hands remain in the shadows. As we look at this parable, we can acknowledge it is complicated. It tells the story of real life on many levels. Here with the elder son, we see a different story from the story of the runaway. This older son has stayed home. He has done all the outward things that were required of him. He even looks the part in that red cloak and fancy clothes. But inside, he has wandered away from the father. The problem is he did his duty. He fulfilled his obligations. But as he did that, he lost track of what it means to be a son. He has been going through the motions. From the outcome, we find that he really didn't have a relationship with his father at all. Listen to the language he uses. All these years I have slaved for you and never disobeyed your commands. That's not a way a loving son speaks to his father. These are words of someone who has done his duty. You see, he forgot his story. He forgot his identity. He forgot that life was bigger than himself and that he was part of something larger. He forgot the love of the father because he was so caught up in himself. He is home, but away. Like I said, this parable is complicated. You see, the hard part of this parable is that with the younger son, it's black and white. It's like the bad guy wearing the black outfit in those old movies. He stood up, shouted his discontent, and then abandoned everything that had been of value in his life. And it's easy to see the sin there. It's easy to place the blame. The younger son was a troublemaker, and the older son has some good reasons to be angry. We can all see it. We feel the injustice, but things are different with the older son. Here things are so much more subtle. After all, he's doing all the right things and he's been trying to do all the good things. How can anyone find fault with that? Part of the complication of the story is that nothing is black and white. The difficulty in this parable is that it's so real. Nobody's all bad and nobody is all good. We get caught up in thinking that they are one or the other or that we are one or the other. The older son, at least in this part of the parable, he's only seeing the bad in his brother and he's so angry that he can't even say, my brother, he has to say, your son. There's no chance for him to see anything else. And he sees only the good in himself. Like all of us, some of the time, we can get caught there too. 
We all hope, have those times in our own lives when we are trying diligently to do all the right things, to be good, acceptable, likable, worthy, an example for others. We can get blinded by everything else. Sometimes we can find that just when we want to be the most selfless, we become obsessed with being loved or unloved. Just when we want to be the most generous, we get caught up in questioning why other people aren't as generous as we are. We know the song. We can be overtaken by our own insecurities and we can get stuck there. You see, as Henry Nouwen says, this parable is about you and me. Sometimes we too lose sense of our larger story, our identity as beloved and treasured children of God. Where do we stand in relationship to the Father's embrace? Are we the one who strayed, hung in there when others took their marbles and went home? Have we been like the one who did the right thing and now feel that we are paying for it? Sometimes it's hard to stay, even when it's the right thing to do. After a while, we can lose sight. We can lose vision and start going through the motions and find that we have lost heart too. The older son's anger is justified. The younger son just walked away. But it's one thing to be rightly angered over injustice. But when resentment takes over, when we can no longer see the good for the bad, and we can't get past ourselves. It becomes all about us. And we can, fit, can forget what we are doing and who we are and whose we are. Maybe you have walked away. Maybe you're considering returning. Maybe you never left, but are in some ways away. Maybe you are right where you need to be. Thank God for that blessing. And maybe like me, you have those good days and those not such good days. I have found that only when I recognize my need for grace can I recognize my need for the Father. Recognizing my need for grace means taking that hard, honest look at myself. It's interesting that Jesus leaves the parable open-ended. We know that the father comes out to the older son. He invites him into the embrace. The father reminds the son that everything he has is and always will be belongs to his son. But we don't know the end of the story. Jesus leaves that for us to ponder. But what do we know? What are we sure of? It's the love of the father. How do you think this parable ends? Does the older son after time, maybe after months or years, enter into the joy of the father? Or does he remain always and forever on the outside, home, but away? The younger son in the parable and in the painting allows himself to be held in that forgiving embrace. The elder brother stands back, looking at his father's merciful gestures, but cannot step over his anger to let his father love him too. Both sons have hard choices. Both of them coming back to the father was difficult for the younger son because he knew how wrong he had been and for the older son because he couldn't get past his own goodness. Father in the parable never stops loving either of them. And at some point we have to believe that God loves us like that too. We have to recognize we belong in that embrace. We make that distance between us and God and that space creates a tension asking for resolution. God stands arms wide open. The older son is right. The younger son did not get what he deserved. And as it seems, neither did the older son. But at the same time, isn't that the point of the story? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son not to condemn the world, but that the world, the people that you and me might be saved through him. The father loves us so much that Christ came into the world for each and every one of us to show us that love through his life 
as hard as it was, through his suffering and death, which are beyond our understanding, and in his resurrection, changes everything forever. Christ continues to make things new, but this is nothing we deserve. If we got what we deserved, we would be in a pretty sorry state. Praise God, the one constant in this parable is the love of the Father. Lent is the time we make our journey home. Lent is the time to be home, not away, but home in that light, in that embrace. Lent is the time to repent and come home, to trust in the love of the Father and allow the Father to have his way with us. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now move into the service of confession, and Norma will be leading us. Would you join me in the bulletin for the prayer of confession from Psalm 73? Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. My feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped because I envied the arrogant. They suffer no pain. Their bodies are fit and strong. They are never in trouble. They are never weighed down. Their eyes bulge out from eating so well. Their hearts overflow with delusions. They scoff and talk so cruel from their privileged positions. And what they say is this, how could God possibly know? Meanwhile, I have kept my heart pure for no good reason. I have washed my hands to stay innocent for nothing. I am weighed down all day long. I'm punished every morning, and when I tried to understand these things, it just seemed like hard work until, until I entered God's sanctuary. Then I understood what would happen to the wicked. God's words lead us to understanding and to repentance. When my heart was bitter, when I was cut up inside, I was stupid and arrogant. But you held my hand, my strong hand. You were always with me. You have guided me with your advice, and later you will receive me with the glory. Forgiveness and grace offered. We are loved and forgiven by God of abundant grace. For me, it is good, me to God. I have taken my refuge in God, and I praise your works now and always. Now we'll sing the closing hymn. There is, a now, there is now a new creation. It's printed in your bulletin.
beloved people of God, that father goes with us now. We're never left alone. Go now with the blessing from our father. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and me and grant us peace. And all else it is that we need for God is faithful. And in receiving this loving blessing from our God, all God's people say, Amen. Please be seated for the postlet.